what is my bucket list for space exploration? We're well into my bucket list. Um, we've launched commercial crew cargo uh, successfully. We now have two companies. Uh, the next thing is successfully launching commercial crew vehicles from Boeing and SpaceX. Uh, we've launched uh, already Orion, but I want to put Orion on top of uh, the SLS and launch it on its way to its first uh, cislunar mission, uh, hopefully in the 2018, 19, 20 time frame. Um, I'm looking, believe it or not, one of my bucket list items is um, bringing into being a commercial supersonic transport. Uh, and we're working with American industry right now. We just need to be able to finalize the data to the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, so that they can modify the regulations that today prohibit supersonic flight over ground. Uh, looking at new developments in hypersonic technology, that's, that's what we need to be able to study to, to know how to get huge payloads on the surface of Mars. So those are just a few of the things in my bucket list. I've got a long bucket list. You know, to my knowledge, no. But that doesn't mean anything. We are working, we have actually asked for uh, people to come to us with uh, proposals on what I call game-changing in-space propulsion. So that might be something like a warp drive, uh, ion propulsion, Vasimer propulsion. Um, so we're not discounting anything. We, have, we, have, we actually have several contracts right now for people to bring us game-changing in-space propulsion, non-chemical. Yeah. Michael, do we have any guidelines for encountering aliens in space? Uh, that's a good question, and, and let me say, I don't know, but I will try to find out and get word to somebody. Um, you know, it's, it's, we probably don't have guidelines because we don't realistically think that we're going to encounter somebody like you or me, that kind of alien. We do have guidelines for dealing with microbial uh, life if we find it. In fact, we have guidelines that prevent us from for example, on Mars, getting too close to a, a place that may be a source of, of living organisms because we don't want to contaminate that area. So we have very strict, what we call planetary uh, protection guidelines that keep us from contaminating another planet that we visit or something of that nature. Oh, Roger, your question about what can a college student do to get a job at NASA. If you're, a, if you're an American citizen, uh, I would recommend that you go into your, you know, your candidate guidance, your, your guidance office or whatever it is, and uh, go to usajobs.gov and apply for a NASA internship at one of the na nine NASA centers. Today, if you're an international student, you can actually do the same thing. You can go to the NASA website and look under internships, and we now have a program that's called NASA International Intern. So an international student can now, provided that their country is willing to pay for them to come, they can actually come and spend a summer as an intern or a period of time as an intern at a NASA center. Nathan, uh, do I agree with Dr. Hawking? How can anyone disagree with Stephen Hawking? I, I had the privilege of meeting him in Cambridge this past year, and, and he is absolutely incredible and I am, I am like he, I am one who believes that uh, the, the species that will survive forever, maybe, is a multi-planet species. So I agree with him that we need to get off this planet or at least demonstrate that we have the ability to, to go out and survive off this planet, as does President Obama, by the way, who announced that, you know, our intention now, NASA's intention is to explore deep space not for the purpose of just going out and checking it out and coming back, but for the purpose of, of living, of staying. What is the one thing, Krista, Krista what is the one thing that I would like for people to know about NASA? I, I, I think the one thing that I would like for everyone to know is that we spend every single day of every single, every single minute of every single day uh, trying to advance the causes of science, technology, and engineering so that life here on this planet is better for every single one of you. That's, that's our focus. Oh, Joshua, why, hasn't, why haven't we developed a true successor to the space shuttle? 
I think we, I think we have, we are developing a true successor to the space shuttle, and it, de it depends on what, what you think the successor should be. If you're looking for another vehicle that has a large payload bay and can deliver things to low Earth orbit, um, that wasn't our intent. Our intent was to develop two, two classes of vehicles. One, an exploration class of vehicles that could take humans to deep space, places like the moon, asteroids, Mars, that's Orion and SLS. Uh, and then vehicles that would be able to do what, what the shuttle used to do in giving us access to low Earth orbit. And that's commercial cargo, which is operating right now, that takes supplies to and from the International Space Station. Uh, and sub a commercial crew with Boeing and SpaceX in the works to be able to take our crews to low Earth orbit. So we, we, are, we are pretty, pretty well down the road to developing the successors. Timing was horrible uh, because it depended on a lot of funding that, that we didn't get in the, in the early stages of the game, so the development fell behind. We should, we should have been flying commercial spacecraft with humans this year, 2015, uh, but you've got to have the funding to do that, and, and it, it didn't come, so we're not, we're not flying humans right now. Quintus, uh, Quintus Maximus. Do I see NASA having a role to defend science? Um, I don't think our role is to defend science. I think our role is to go out and, and pursue scientific excellence, to make, uh, make our assets available, which includes the International Space Station, uh, observatories around the world, laboratories and the like, make them available to, to scientific investigators so that they can pursue their interest in science. Um, and, and, and then science will take care of itself. I don't think anyone should have to defend uh, the critical importance of science. We demonstrated every single day, as I said earlier, uh, by pursuing our vision of make, going and discovering things away from Earth that make life better for people here on Earth every single day. Allison, what would our top priority be if we had significantly more funding? Um, you know, I, I have said all along, we would, not, we would not bring you anything new that we're not already pursuing. What we would do would be, we would buy down the risk on those things that we're doing right now. We would speed our way into uh, an efficient, effective commercial availability of, car, of crew, crew transportation to low Earth orbit. Uh, we'd be really beaten, I mean, going as fast as we could to bring Orion and SLS uh, to their operational capability. And what we would be able to do would be to put significantly more money into uh, development of game-changing in-space propulsion uh, to speed the journey from Earth to Mars. We don't, we don't have the funds to do that right now, so we would put more money into our aeronautics programs speeding supersonic flight to the, to the, not just the American public, but people around the world. Uh, we would greatly improve upon the ability of unmanned aerial systems to be able to fly in, in the airspace of nations around the world. Uh, we'd be design, designing much better vehicles for transportation of humans to deep space so that they don't have to spend the time in, in that environment that they do today. Vashanabi, what is the one dis a, a discovery in space that I would have thought impossible when I started my career? Um, there have been so I never, I never dreamed in my wildest imagination that we would discover a planet like Pluto when I, when I started my career in spaceflight. Um, to find a living planet that uh, has tectonic activity, that has uh, somewhat of an atmosphere, that has mountains, uh, that's mind-boggling. Um, to actually have landed a comet, uh, landed a, a vehicle on a comet the way that, that, we've, that, our, that our European partners have done just in the past year or so, um, that was inconceivable, uh, you know, when I started in the space program. Um, to have airplanes that today are able to sense uh, that they're getting too close to the ground and to warn a, a crew member in, in, on, in the result of in action by the crew member to physically pull the airplane away to avoid um, unintended flight into ground, saving um, airmen in our military services. Um, I dreamed of that happening, but I never thought we would see it in my, my time in NASA, and we, those are just a couple of the things. Uh, 
Uh, I am actually a, st Kevin, I am a Star Trek fan because um, I like the Federation. I think that's what we're about on the International Space Station. I'm a big advocate for peace uh, in, the, in, in the world, not just on the planet, but in, in everything. And I think the International Space Station, it's my favorite candidate for a Nobel Peace Prize because of what we've done on station, considering everything else that's going on down here on Earth. So I'm, I'm definitely a Trekkie. Ah, Jason, why do we keep sending Matt Damon into space? Uh, because he is such a, I, I, don't, I didn't do it, but I would pick him because he is such a great uh, representative of the kind of innovative, uh, devil-may-care people that we have in the astronaut office, for one thing, as you saw in The Martian. He was a, he was a typical astronaut, to be quite honest, uh, somebody full of curiosity, incredibly smart and, uh, and inventive, and somebody who says, look, I don't care what, what my condition is, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, so he's a great representative for today's astronaut corps. <music> Juliet Hunter, uh, who was my favorite childhood hero? My dad was my number one childhood hero. He was my, um, he was an incredible dad. Um, he was my high school football coach. Uh, so I had two incredible men in one. Um, I wasn't a very good football player. Um, and then when you talk about science fiction-y kind of people, um, I love um, Buck Rogers. You know, I, I never dreamed of going to space myself but, um, or becoming an astronaut, but, but I was always admired by, you know, the way he could walk out to his spaceship and just go to Mars, uh, care, you know, just frivolously. And then as I grew older, um, I began to pick heroes like John Kennedy, uh, you know, the late president of the United States and, and people like, like him. Yeah. Do aliens exist? Uh, I don't know. Um, I do, but I am one who believes that there is life elsewhere in the universe. And you and I talked a little bit about it earlier. So I guess bottom line is I believe we're going to find signs of microbial life uh, in a number of candidate places. Could be the, the ocean of Europa, could be Enceladus. Hopefully we'll be on, uh, on the planet Mars as we get, as we do more and more work there. First with robotic precursors and eventually with humans in the 2030s. Seth, what do I find about being the hardest part about being in space? Um, you know, I, I, I was privileged to fly four times, and although it got more and more familiar each time, it never became old. Uh, hardest part about being in space, jeez, uh, was trying to keep up with all the different tasks that you had to do over the course of a very short flight in shuttle, because we, we only flew days at a time, um, trying to get everything done and yet make time to get into the window where you could get the most phenomenal view of our planet um, ever known to man. Uh, just, just trying to balance so that you could spend some time just in the window reflecting. Michael, what's my biggest hope for the future of NASA and space travel? Uh, my, my biggest hope for NASA is that we will continue to be the, uh, the visionary, innovative, um, uh, risk-taking organization that I think we are today, uh, doing great things for the nation and, and for the world, and um, being the organization that, that sets the example for people around the world that if we take care of the planet, if we take care of other people, then somebody else will take care of us. Um, and I think that's my hope for the world, is that, that NASA will be a leader um, in scientific exploration and discovery and a leader in human exploration to get us off this planet and make us a multi-planet species. Uh, Dan, what, what, what's the likelihood and percentage that humans will land on Mars in this century? I, I, I'm the eternal optimist and so I would say 100%. That, this century is young. You know, it's 2015. so. I, I think that's a, unless, unless humanity decides, forget it, uh, we are going to stick with this planet no matter what. We'll be on Mars easily uh, in the first half of this century. Can 
Ben Tutton, what, what was the scariest part about being an astronaut and the scariest experience I had in space? Didn't really have any scary, scary experiences in space. And, and I don't know that there was anything scary about being an astronaut. The, I will say the most intimidating thing, the, the thing that caused you the most angst um, was before each flight, um, before each mission, before liftoff, uh, having it go through your mind that you could do the one thing that would, would endanger your crew and not wanting to do that. that that's, uh, that's a frightening thought that as the pilot or the commander that you could do one thing that, that could spell doom for your crew and you just, that was not a comfortable feeling. Um, I think though, I, I do have one scary thing. The, actually the, the, the scariest thing to me was on my second flight when we were deploying the Hubble Space Telescope and one of the solar arrays didn't go out and I, I was told to go uh, prepare Bruce McCandless and Kathy Sullivan for a spacewalk. That they didn't end up, they ended up not having to do it. But as the intravehicular crewman who had to dress them and make sure that their suits were all tight and everything else, um, I never expected that would be scary. That was scary to me, um, to realize that, that uh, their lives depended on, on my doing my job. Jacob, do, should we be my, allowed to mine asteroids? I think within, within the bounds of some system of governance, uh, whether it's the United Nations or some international body that comes up rule, with rules uh, for mining, I think it's essential. I think we're going to find that there are certain elements, certain things that are available uh, on asteroids, on other planetary surfaces that will make life better here on Earth, uh, and I think we need to be able to get them. But I think we need to make sure that we put um, very sound, reasonable rules in place uh, that govern the actual conduct of that, of that mining or that, that resource utilization, if you will. The, the big thing that I want to see achieved is the James Webb Space Telescope being safely put uh, in its position at uh, Lagrange Point about a million miles away from Earth uh, and going into operation, peering into the atmosphere of uh, one of the thousands of exoplanets we've now discovered and finding that, uh, yea, verily, its atmosphere contains all the constituents to support life, uh, you know, on a planet around another sun. And that's the potential of the James Webb Space Telescope. That would be mind-boggling. Oh, Jonathan, which solar system body other than Mars is most intriguing to the scientific community? Uh, you know, there is no answer to that because the scientific community is huge. If you happen to be a planetary scientist, uh, my guess is you are most intrigued today with, uh, with Pluto. Uh, because of what we discovered from New Horizons. Uh, some planetary scientists who look at small bodies are blown away by uh, two asteroids, one called Vesta and the other one Ceres, that have both been visited by Dawn, a spacecraft that NASA launched many years ago and has now visited both, the two largest asteroids in the main asteroid belt. Uh, and then you have people I already mentioned, uh, like my chief scientist, Ellen Stofan, who is a uh, Cassini, former Cassini chief scientist who is infatuated with Saturn. So it, it depends on the community. Um, when you talk about which other body in our solar system, they're, they're also intriguing. And there are people who want to go to Venus. So, yeah. OK, Heaven, thanks for the question. What, what on a small and large scale have been done to prepare for, uh, for a solar storm? Uh, one of NASA's four primary areas of science is heliophysics. It's the study of our sun. And we have satellites that have been orbiting the sun and peering at it for many decades now, trying to measure and, and put into place some system of modeling uh, the occurrence of what we call um, uh, solar storms or coronal mass ejections, just ejections of giant quantities of energy from the sun, because we know at some point, you know, sooner or later, we're going to get a, a giant burst of energy from the sun that potentially could knock out communications on Earth. Even, you know, particularly our satellites that are way out in geosynchronous orbit that are not as protected as some of them closer to Earth. Um, so w the biggest thing you want to know is, is 
forecasting and prediction so that you can, you can harden uh, the spacecraft, you can turn them in a direction that might enable them to withstand the storm. But we're, not, we're not going to prevent, there is no way to prevent nature from occurring. So we're going to be the victims of massive solar storms in the, in the years ahead. We just want to be able to better forecast them so that we can take action, be able to better harden the satellites that will have to withstand their, their penetration in the light. Javier, what's the greatest challenge facing inter interstellar travel? Uh, speed. And that, you know, it, it, I assume, Javier, you're talking about humans. Uh, the thing that will prevent humans from engaging in interstellar travel for the foreseeable future is the lack of speed. And that's why I said, it, when ask, answering somebody else's question about what would I do if we had a massive infusion of funds, we'd put a lot more investment into game-changing in-space propulsion, plasma fusion, uh, solar electric, solar nuclear, um, or nuclear electric, uh, Vasimer, a lot of different kinds of proposed propulsion that uh, theoretically would reduce the transit time to Mars, for example, from eight months today to uh, four months or less. Um, that's what it's going to take. Uh, warp drive, as, as fanciful as that may be. Um, you know, that, that's, that's what it's going to take. Not out of the realm of possibility, but we just, we're not there yet. Yeah. Administrator Bolden, thank yeah. you so much for joining us today. Hey, it is great to be here, and I, re I really want to thank uh, the audience of IFL Science. Um, you know, I have, didn't know a lot about you, but I have become a big fan. Uh, I, I love everything about what you do, and, and thank you very much for making, uh, making it possible for us to, to interact with your audience for this very brief period of time. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much.